are looking live at a Falcon 9 rocket on the launch pad at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. At 6.01 this evening, the aerospace company SpaceX will launch a Dragon cargo spacecraft on a NASA mission to resupply the International Space Station. Good evening and welcome everyone to NASA's Kennedy Space Center for our live coverage of the launch of the 18th resupply mission for SpaceX. I'm your host, Jennifer Wolfinger. We are about 16 minutes away from the planned liftoff of a Falcon 9 rocket from the coast of Florida. The mission? To fly much needed astronaut supplies and research experiments up to the International Space Station. And we have a team of correspondents across the country helping us cover all the angles of this launch. We will head to the Mission Director Center here on the Space Coast to get updates on the weather and the countdown. And we'll head west to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, and check in at Mission Control Houston at Johnson Space Center. We also have a correspondent here with one of the agency's top engineers. But first, here are some quick facts about today's launch. SpaceX transported the Falcon 9 rocket out to the launch pad and lifted it to vertical launch position for the 18th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. The plan is to keep the Dragon spacecraft docked to station for about four weeks before bringing it back to Earth. This is the third flight for the Dragon spacecraft and the second time this Falcon booster has been flown. Dragon will deliver more than 5,000 pounds of astronaut supplies and payloads for science research to the orbiting laboratory. Now let's bring in NASA's Daryl Nail, who's in the Mission Director Center, just a few miles away from the launch pad. Daryl? Hey, Jen. Yes, so weather is improving. That was a concern yesterday and the cause of a scrub launch and a 24-hour hold. And now here we are back again, trying it again, and we have some weather issues. As you look at this particular angle, you can see that there's a cloud deck off in the distance that is a concern. We just lifted the thick cloud layer rule, which is a constraint that prevents launch in the cases of very thick clouds. But then you look at this angle and you can see nothing but blue skies as we look out towards the east and the north. So it is a dynamic situation and that's because we have a cold front that has stalled out over central Florida. I want to show you the radar and, and you can see what we mean here. You see all the clouds around the green and the blue moving uh, from west to east over Florida. You see where Space Launch Complex 40 is and that's the spot we'll be launching the rocket. As you see those clouds moving and that rain moving uh, to the east, it has been dissipating a little. Earlier today, we had issues with disturbed weather and thick clouds, but uh, weather officers just lifted the thick cloud layer rule. And then just about an hour ago, they lifted the disturbed weather rule. So conditions are improving, and that's a good thing. Here's our overall forecast for you. The winds 8 to 12 miles per hour out of the west-northwest. Temperature low 80s. Concerns are disturbed weather and thick cloud rule. Uh, but we are 50% go because of those lingering conditions around the pad. But as of right now, there's good news. We are go for launch in terms of the weather right now. The launch director not working any other issues with regards to the pad, the rocket, or the spacecraft, and that's good news. So everything's looking go at the moment. We are counting down. They are fueling up the rocket, and we'll have an update for you in just a little bit. So we'll send it back to you in the studio, Jen. Thanks, Daryl, and we'll check back with you a little later. Right now, we are about T minus 13 minutes and counting. Let's check in with SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where the Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon were designed and built. Virgil Kellehessen is joining us from SpaceX's Mission Control Center. Virgil, can you tell us a little bit about Dragon's history and reusability? Sure thing, Jennifer. This mission marks SpaceX's ninth launch of 2019, and today we'll be launching a flight-proven Dragon spacecraft. This launch is also particularly exciting as it will be the first time we've flown Dragon for a third mission. This vehicle visited the International Space Station previously for our CRS-6 mission back in April 2015 and for CRS-13 in December 2017. Both Falcon uh, 9 and Dragon were designed with reflight in mind, so the vehicle hardware is built to support multiple missions with minimal minimal refurbishment in between. As noted, this Dragon has flown twice before, while the booster you see on screen we'll be launching today has flown once. After stage separation, we'll be bringing it back to land in landing zone one at Cape Canaveral, so that can be reused on future missions. To provide a little historical background, in 2010, SpaceX became the first private company to send a spacecraft to orbit and return it to Earth. Then only two years later, Dragon became the first privately developed spacecraft to visit the space station. 
Our Dragon spacecraft has been flying for nearly seven years now, and today it is one of the few vehicles that can deliver significant cargo to the ISS, and the only one that can deliver cargo from it. To date, SpaceX has made 19 trips to the ISS, and we're under contract with NASA for a total of 26 of these cargo resupply missions. With that, back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Virgil. Liftoff of today's rocket from Launch Complex 40 is timed right down to the very second. The reason for this? SpaceX needs to get their cargo spacecraft lined up to rendezvous with the International Space Station. For more on this, let's check in with NASA's Leah Cheshire, who's live at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Leah? Thanks, Jennifer, and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston. This is a team of flight controllers, and each of them are experts on a specific system aboard the International Space Station. They're being led today by Greg Whitney. We also have six astronauts aboard the International Space Station. That's Christina Cook, Alexia Chinin, and Nick Haig, who all arrived in March. They're joined by Luca Parmitano, Alexander Skvortsov, and Andrew Morgan, who just arrived on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing this past Saturday, July 20th. We're nearing the 10 o'clock hour, so the astronauts are off duty, and they actually have the opportunity to be watching the launch this afternoon. Once Dragon launches today, it will arrive at the International Space Station on Saturday morning, July 27th. There will be a process of astronaut Nick Haig entering the cupola module, and he'll use the Canada Arm 2 to reach out and grapple the spacecraft while backed up by NASA's Christina Cook. He'll then turn the controls back over to uh, robotics controllers here on the ground who will continue using the Canada Arm 2 to reposition the spacecraft, bring it up to the station's Harmony module where it will be berthed and remain for about a month. Those are the processes uh, and the milestones we'll be looking forward to this Saturday, July 27th, and you can tune in to our live coverage beginning at 7.30 a.m. Central Time. For now, we're just looking forward to the launch. Back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Leah. The Dragon spacecraft will be filled with critical materials to directly support science and research that will take place on the International Space Station. A new international docking adapter called IDA-3 is one of CRS-18's primary payloads. When installed, the adapter will provide a connecting point for spacecraft designed to carry astronauts for NASA's commercial crew program, as well as non-NASA missions. The adapters are built to the International Docking System Standard, which means any spacecraft designed using these measurements can use the adapter. The Biofabrication Facility, or BFF, is designed to print organ-like tissues and microgravity. Printing the complex structures found inside human organs has proven difficult to accomplish in Earth's gravity environment. BFF is an early step in a long-term plan to eventually manufacture whole human organs in space. Another exciting payload is the BioRock investigation. With BioRock, we hope to gain insights into how microbes grow in space and how we might use them in human exploration and settlement of space, from mining to turning rocks into soil on the moon and Mars. We are now about eight minutes from launch. Let's head back over to the Mission Director Center to get an update from NASA's Daryl Now. Yeah. All right, Jennifer, that's right. We're uh, here at Hangar AE at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station where things are looking good weather-wise. They weren't earlier today. In fact, as you know, we had rain throughout the area that rolled over uh, the spaceport here, uh, but uh, the rain has stopped. You see a patch of blue sky uh, in the previous angle, and right there you see a whole bunch of blue sky. So the weather has been improving as we've gone along today, going from 70% no-go to a 50-50 shot of uh, going. And if you just look at the conditions from some of these cameras, you can clearly see some sunlight uh, shining there on the rocket. We know overhead it's looking good, but uh, weather officers are concerned with a 10-mile radius around the launch pad as well as 20 miles out from the pad. Uh, this would be downrange where the rocket's going. You can see here on our weather radar where Space Launch Complex 40 is in regards to this map, and we've had good signs from this right here. You see the weather, the blue, the green, uh, kind of dissipating as it goes along, and that's showing the rain. 
that's good news because they lifted that disturbed weather rule earlier today, and you can certainly see why. But as far as the thick clouds, that is something they are still keeping an eye on. Now, we just heard that they are chilling the engines now as you get a beautiful panorama shot of landing zone one where the booster will be coming back to land. And we want to talk a little bit about the rocket and the spacecraft on this particular mission. Right there is the first time the booster came back, the one that's on the pad today, and a beautiful landing stuck it right there in the center. Uh, that particular booster flew on CRS-17, came back down to land right here in Cape Canaveral uh, against the backdrop of a, a beautiful ocean here at the Atlantic. And uh, it's just a serene scene all around the pad there as it uh, rocket engines fired to bring it down to a very uh, beautiful landing. And then there's the spacecraft at the top of the rocket, which is also familiar to launch. And there you can see a live look as oxygen, liquid oxygen, is venting off from the sides. A close-up look at the side shows you uh, just how it's been into space. The two ISS badges that you see under the letter P in SpaceX, those mark the two previous missions that this Dragon has flown on, CRS-13 and CRS-6. No stranger to the International Space Station, uh, both greatly successful missions. And now it is back for a third mission, which marks a record for SpaceX. And then on the right, just underneath the X, you can see the word Apollo, 50th. And that was a nice badge that uh, SpaceX put on there to help us commemorate Apollo's 50th anniversary for uh, Apollo 11, which we just wrapped up a week of uh, anniversary events uh, for Apollo 11, the return of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael uh, Collins from space on that historic mission to the moon. In fact, yesterday would mark uh, 50 years to the day that they returned uh, and a splashdown out there in the Pacific Ocean. Now as you look at the rocket, you'll note that top to bottom, you see water uh, vapor uh, streaming off the side. And then uh, up near the, the, the black portion of the rocket, uh, you see it venting some of that liquid oxygen. And that's just to allow that pressure relief to go there. But that rocket there is so cold, and the air around it is so humid that's what creates that water vapor uh, that you see coming off uh, the Falcon 9 rocket. We're hearing from the launch director. He's talking to his crew, and uh, so far everything's looking good. We've proceeded uh, pretty, pretty good for this count. No major issues were worked during the count, and we're sitting at four minutes now and counting until launch, and uh, weather is go, and that's a good thing. As we look at the rocket there, you can clearly see we've got a beautiful uh, blue sky above. Yesterday we had some issues. As you, If you followed uh, the launch yesterday, we had 70% no-go. We got right up to 30 seconds, and they called it off uh, because the weather constraints uh, uh, wouldn't allow it to go. And um, But wouldn't you know it, 12 minutes later, <laughs> the range went green, the weather went green. Uh, so it was similar to today in that we had weather that was looking a little dicey in the early going, but then just steadily improved. All right, we're three minutes and 21 seconds now, and so uh, things are starting to ramp up here in terms of the count. Um, they're getting ready to check the thrust vector control. They're also sending up some weather balloons to make sure that the upper levels of the atmosphere are still good to go. Because you can see in this shot, Stage you see one, the clouds off to the down. right. Uh, they are still worried about thick clouds. And so they've got weather balloons going up to check that. And we're just now hearing they closed out the locks uh, fueling with liquid seconds. oxygen. We've cleared our two constraints we were tracking earlier today. Let's Weather's listen in. for flight. The evaluation of uh, dragon paint on the trunk section indicates uh, no concerns. Again, now T minus two minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. So good sign there from the launch director. In just about 60 seconds, they'll um, put the Falcon 9 in startup, as well as the Dragon spacecraft. 
And right about the same time, they'll command the flight computer for the final pre-launch checks. Stage 2 lock float is closed out. Some beautiful views around the Cape as we are go for launch in terms of the weather. We're now listening for the launch director Cap to tell us uh, whether they are go for launch uh, from his team. And that's going to happen in just about 45 seconds. You see there all the venting both on the rocket and on the ground from the liquid oxygen. She's fueled up and ready to go. Falcon 9's in startup. Dragon is in startup. All right, now we're listening for that go for launch. Go for launch. And there it is, the final seconds now. At about 18 seconds, they're going to flood the pad with water. Minus 30 seconds. And that's a sound suppression. Ignition is at three seconds. And then they let it go. Minus 15 seconds. Ten, and the final seconds nine, now. Eight. Seven. seven six. six five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. And liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft. On the heels of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11's return from the moon, we send more science and supplies up to the International Space Station. Flight operation. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Looking beautiful so far. Great shot from the bottom. Power and telemetry nominal. We're approaching max Q. Maximum pressure on the rocket. Vehicle is supersonic. All right, I'll quickly throttle back. Vehicle is experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. Impact engine chill. So they begin chilling the engine on the second stage to get it ready to go. Beautiful shot there, looking up the tail end of the rocket. And there's the cape getting smaller and smaller. main engine cutoff. And you'll see separation just a little bit right after the engine's cut off. And down they go. Nico. There it is. Stage separation confirmed. And there goes the booster, which is coming back to land here at the Cape. And back ignition. Stage one boost back startup. And there it is. Great shot of that booster coming off as it performs the boost back burn.
but you can see it clear as day in the sun. That's the first of three burns as that booster gets ready to come back down. What a great shot. And there's the second stage. Proceeding into space. Stage one boost back shutdown. Both vehicles are following nominal trajectories. See the grid fins being deployed? That's help steer, steer the uh, the booster back down to Earth. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. So you can see the, the little exhaust there that uh, is steering that booster back down. And that from inside the second stage. Still got a shot of that booster coming down. Now it's vertical. That's a great shot. And it is falling fast. Both vehicles continue to follow nominal trajectories. So SpaceX confirming that everything's looking good for both the booster that's falling back as well as the second stage, the spacecraft that are uh, getting ready to enter orbit. It's hard to keep a track on that booster because it is falling fast. That's a great shot, though. All right. Well, we're going to toss it over to SpaceX and let them take it from here for the landing of the first stage as well as the rest of the mission. Go ahead. Thank you, Daryl. In order to make its way back to our landing zone, the first stage is going to execute a series of three burns. The first is a boost back burn, which you've seen earlier, which is meant to slow the rocket down and orient it for re-entry. Shortly after this first burn, as you saw, the grid fins deployed. Those are the fins located near the top of the first stage, and they're deployed to help guide the rocket during descent. Following the boost back burn, Falcon 9 executes an entry burn, which is coming up shortly. It's to slow itself down before hitting the dense part of the atmosphere. Now last is the landing burn, which happens just before touchdown, providing the booster a soft descent to land. And our four landing legs also deploy at this time. You just heard the call out for the stage one entry burn. That'll go for about 10 to 15 seconds. Burn shut down. At this point, both the boost back burn and the entry burn have been completed, so we're just waiting Let on that final feet. landing burn coming up in about 10 to 15 seconds. Let's keep an eye on the screen to see if we can see those engines light. It should be coming up in about 10 seconds. FTS is saved. Stage one, entry transonic.
<laughs> and you can hear the landing burn just started. They heard the call out. Watch those landing legs deploy coming up shortly. Stage two has entered terminal guidance. There you can see those landing legs deploy. And touchdown of the Falcon 9 and landing zone Falcon one in Cape Canaveral. You can hear me. Congratulations to everyone here at SpaceX for another successful landing. This secondary mission is an important part of our commitment to vehicle reusability. And this marks the 44th successful first stage recovery. That's an amazing shot. Now back to our primary mission, continuing with our second stage on its way to desired orbit. The MVAC-D, or Merlin uh, vacuum engine, that you should see on screen shortly, is preparing to power down as expected. And the second engine cutoff is coming up shortly. Let's listen in for that. At this point, there was a call up for a good orbit. Up next is deployment of Dragon from that second stage. Now when Dragon separates from the second stage, we will get the first glimpse inside its trunk. Dragon carries two types of cargo, unpressurized cargo in that trunk section, and pressurized cargo inside the capsule itself. At this point, we're about a few seconds or so from Dragon separation, so let's listen in for the call out on the net. That should be very soon. Dragon separation confirmed. Echo, we have signal. This is Dragon TC on countdown one. Dragon there it is. We have a confirmed successful deployment of the Dragon spacecraft. With Dragon deployed, the next major milestone will be deployment of the solar arrays as Dragon makes its way to the International Space Station. That's coming up in just uh, about two minutes. Now let's pass it off to Leah Cheshire for a coverage of the solar array deploy. Thanks, Virgil. And wow, that is so exciting to see not only a launch, but an awesome uh, return. And also, we are looking forward to the Solar Array deploys, the next part of Dragon's mission. So that occurs about 12 minutes after launch. Uh, and during the launch, the International Space Station was flying about 254 statute miles over Oman. Uh, near the Arabian Sea. So we are going to take just a moment and wait for that confirmation of the Solar Array deploy. This is Dragon CC on Countdown 1. Dragon's propulsion system has successfully primed, and all thrusters report ready for firing. This is Dragon CC on Countdown 1. Dragon is deploying its solar arrays. A great shot there of Dragon beginning its solar array deploy.
And obviously, we've got a great view of those solar arrays and uh, just got the confirmation of successful deployment. So it sounds like they are providing power to the Dragon over its two-day journey to the International Space Station. Dragon will begin firing its thrusters to bring it up to the same level as the space station, which is traveling 17,500 miles an hour. And when it arrives on July 27th, it will be the fifth visiting vehicle on the space station. When it arrives, it has a few uh, checkpoints that it'll meet. So first, it'll become it'll come upon the approach ellipsoid. That's an invisible line about a kilometer around the station, and that's when the joint operations begin between Mission Control and SpaceX. It'll then move on to a 250 meter hold point where a series of checks will be uh, done on the Dragon, and then cross the 200 meter keep out sphere. That's another invisible line around the space station. It'll move up to a 30 meter hold point. That's the final hold point for Dragon, and the crews will continue to do some checks on the vehicle to make sure it's ready for capture. It'll be about 10 to 12 meters away when Nick Haig takes the control of the Canada Arm 2, backed up by Christina Cook, reaches out and grapples the spacecraft. As we mentioned, he will turn those controls over to robotics controllers on the ground who will use the Canada Arm 2 to maneuver Dragon into a berthing position up at the Harmony module on the International Space Station. The crew will begin to access the cargo over the next month while Dragon remains attached before reloading it with supplies, science that's been conducted on the space station, and sending it back for a safe splashdown. But first, we're just looking forward to Dragon arrival. So after that successful solar array deploy, and now you know what's coming up next, you can join us for the live coverage on Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m. Central Time. With all of that, thank you, Jennifer, and back to you at Kennedy Space Center. Thanks, Leah. Joining us now is SpaceX's Virgil Kalahessen. Virgil, can you tell us a little bit about how launch went tonight? Be my pleasure, Jennifer. We had a beautiful launch at Space Launch Complex 40 today and also a re-landing at a Landing Zone 1. This was our seventh mission to launch a flight-proven Dragon to the space station. I can confirm Dragon is in good orbit as we saw. The solar array is deployed on time and the GNC bay door opening should be underway shortly. Dragon is on its way to the International Space Station on track for capture on Saturday morning at approximately 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. After berthing, the astronauts aboard the ISS will unload those 5,500 pounds of crew supplies and payloads. Then Dragon will return to Earth after approximately one month's stay at the orbiting laboratory. All around, it's been a successful mission so far. And with that, I want to thank you, NASA, the Air Force, the FAA, and all of our customers for their support and hard work to ensure today's launch was a success. Back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Virgil. Along with all the supplies and equipment for the astronauts aboard the space station, there's also a tremendous amount of science on this mission. Here's a look at those investigations.
Dragon is on its way to the space station with plenty of science on board for Expedition 60 and beyond. But there's also something traveling in Dragon's trunk. Let's go to NASA's Laura Aguiar, who is with a guest who can explain this cargo. Thank you. So NASA has been setting the standard for space exploration, and joining me now is Jason August. He's the project manager of NASA Docking Systems. Jason, tell us what's in Dragon's trunk. Well, what we have here is the International Docking Adapter, or IDA. This is IDA-3 that we'll be flying. We've uh, previously flown a docking adapter to the space station, IDA-2, and uh, this particular docking adapter will be installed on the top of Node-2 in the Node-2 Zenith location. So when Dragon gets to the space station, what happens next? Well, Dragon will be berthing to the bottom of Node 2 in, at the uh, Node 2 Nader location. And what will happen is the SSRMS, or the robotic arm, with the SPDM, or the Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator, will actually grapple the IDA and extract that from the trunk. Once it's extracted, it will maneuver to a position where it can where it can thread the needle between the GEM module and the PMM and go all the way to the top of the space station at the node 2 zenith location and then it will uh, interface the IDA with the pressurized mating adapter, PMA3. Okay, so um, why do we have two adapters? Well, we need two adapters because we're going to have more than one uh, docked visiting vehicle at the space station at any given time. Uh, we're going to have two commercial providers that will be uh, ferrying crew to and from the space station. That's SpaceX and Boeing. And we will also have future cargo mission visiting that will dock to the space station as well. So with all of that traffic, uh, we can't handle that with just one port, so we need two docking ports. Well, Jason, thank you very much. It seems like we have something to look forward to on this mission. Back to you. The International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory is sponsoring more than 50 experiments that just launched today. Here's a closer look at that research. Investigations sponsored by the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory are primed for launch on SpaceX's 18th Commercial Resupply Services Mission to Orbiting Laboratory. When we say that this launch is packed with research, we need it. This launch has more payloads than we have ever sent on a single mission. Private sector companies, academic researchers, STEM projects, life and physical sciences, all on this mission. So let's get an idea about some of the payloads that are launching on SpaceX CRS-18. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company is sending what they hope is the first of many investigations to the ISS National Lab. This initial experiment will evaluate the formation of silica particles in microgravity. Silica is a common material used in consumer tires. However, silica and rubber are materials that don't easily bond. Can the microgravity environment of the space station allow Goodyear to find silica morphologies not possible on Earth? If so, this could lead to improvements in fuel efficiency and other performance factors in consumer tires. The space station is an ever-evolving research platform, and NASA and the ISS National Lab are constantly sponsoring new facilities on the orbiting laboratory to increase the capacity for innovative research. This launch, America's first automated bioprinter for use in space, will make its way to station. Developed by TechShot, this bioprinter will initially seek to print cardiac-like tissue. The printed tissues will remain on station until they are strong enough for the return trip to be analyzed on Earth. While the ability to manufacture human organs is likely many years away, this bioprinter could lead to unique methods of industrial biomedicine and microgravity to develop materials for patient care on Earth. Part of the role of the ISS National Lab is to inspire and educate the next generation. And what better way to do that than by forming fun and exciting collaborations with unique partners? Not many young students understand the term non-Newtonian fluidics in a microgravity environment. However, just about every young student is familiar with Nickelodeon and its iconic slime. So on this mission, Nickelodeon Slime in Space will make its way to station for a variety of demonstrations to educate students on the basic concepts of fluid flow and microgravity paired with normal gravity conditions on Earth. So there you have it. Advanced materials, industrial biomedicine, education payloads, new facilities, and repeat flight partners. This mission represents the demand that continues to build as more researchers and companies recognize the unique potential for sustained R&D in microgravity. To learn more about all ISS National Lab sponsored payloads on this mission and how to become part of the space station research community, visit ISSNationalLab.org.
Joining me now is Patrick O'Neill, the national lab expert you just saw in the video. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So you shared some information about the lab in the video. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research? Well, I'm not sure if I can do as good of a job as the guy that was in that video just now. But by the way, first and foremost, what a beautiful launch. Uh, it never gets old. And it's always so awesome to be out here to see a rocket go up. And then on top of that, to know that there is an incredible amount of science that's equally going up on that vehicle. So uh, about the research that's going up that's sponsored by the National Laboratory. So we just saw that video where we focused on a couple of payloads, one of them from Goodyear, one of them from uh, TechShot, who's going to be sending a bio printer up and then one of them from Nickelodeon who's going to be doing a series of STEM demonstrations and all of that's terrific but I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other investigations that are going to be going up on this mission um, so as I mentioned in the video previously we're sending more payloads on this launch than we have ever sent for a national lab mission to the space station so that's exciting in and of itself but I think it's equally exciting when we talk about the amount of companies that are involved so we have 17 separate investigations or, pay or payloads I should say that are private sector related so that's first of all that shows that there is a continuous demand for commercial researchers, private sector utilization of the space station. And then on top of that, you know, the types of people that are using it. So we're looking at big pharmaceutical companies. So AstraZeneca, for instance, they are part of this mission. And this is actually their second mission to the space station, which is something that is also a very exciting trend because it's not just having one experiment, but the fact that companies are doing multiple investigations and iterating on the science that they're doing, it demonstrates that they see the value of leveraging this orbiting platform. Uh, so you, again, we mentioned AstraZeneca. We also have other smaller pharmaceutical companies that are looking to use the space station as, as a way of enhancing their business models. Um, but then outside of some of these commercial companies, we have nonprofit entities. So we have the National Stem Cell Foundation, which is looking at an investigation uh, dedicated towards Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. We have rodents that are going up on this. We have 40 separate uh, mice that are going up on this mission that are going to help us better understand aging characteristics so that we can improve our lives as we continue to age greater fully here on Earth. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of a, a basic snapshot. And then also, we did talk, talk about Nickelodeon. There's more than 40 uh, student experiments in total that are going up on this mission. Yeah. So it's it's not just for uh, big companies. It's not for small companies. It's not just for nonprofits. But it's also for uh, using the space station as a way of enhancing uh, and exciting the next generation of scientists and engineers. That's really fascinating. Thank you for being here to tell us all about that. Absolutely. Now we're going to go back to NASA's Daryl Nail, who has a special guest. Daryl? Thanks, Jen. That's right. We're here with Bill Spetch. He is the Deputy Manager of the International Space Station Transportation Integration Office at NASA. Bill, thank you for joining us after the launch. No problem. It looks like a beauty from where we were watching it. You're obviously watching in a very official capacity. What's the official word uh, from you? Oh, no. It was a great launch. Uh, you know, We were really happy to see the weather clear out the way it did. Um, it was a, a little bit touch and go after yesterday and continuing to watch the forecast as we went, but the clouds cleared out and uh, we got to see a great launch. Yeah, it was 70 percent no go yesterday. Got all the way up to the 624 launch point and, and had uh, weather delays, so couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But then 12, 12 minutes later, it cleared. It cleared. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it could have launched. Today, same setup, 70 percent, but then the weather started to clear just in time about an hour all those weather constraints uh, lifted and it hit right on right on time at 601 right when you needed to yep absolutely you know it's an instantaneous launch window to get to iss for for this and so they have to hit that time frame and that's why we couldn't go yesterday with the weather the way it was even though it cleared out so quickly afterwards you, you got to go right on time to to catch up with the space station the way you need to did you watch the launch uh, live outside, or did you watch it on, uh, on the monitors? So uh, we were over at the uh, the SpaceX Launch Control Center, and uh, we were watching it. We ran outside to go watch it because you gotta you gotta take a look at it outside. You don't really get the effect when you're in the building watching it on the monitors. Yeah, it was just a beautiful launch all the way from start to finish. It it seemed uh, to us. Um, how about that landing? Man, it's impressive every time you see it, and. Uh, you know, it was great to see this one land successfully, uh, and because uh, we flew this this booster on our previous mission, and so this has been one that we've used before, and you know, we'll probably use again. And the Dragon flying for the third time now mm -hmm. to the International Space Station. Your thoughts on the 5,000 uh, pounds of uh, supplies and science that are going up? You know, there, there's dozens of new investigations going up on this flight. Uh, I can't wait for it to get up there and for them to get started on it. 
a couple of really interesting ones that caught my eye as I was looking through it. They're looking at um, a space moss experiment, looking at growing moss in space and seeing how it develops differently than it does down here on Earth. Um, and obviously that has applications as you look forward to exploring other planets and t- how do things grow. Uh, another one that caught my eye, which is another one for terrestrial use, uh, Goodyear Tire actually has an investigation going up on this one, looking at silica fillers and that can improve tire performance, improve gas mileage, and improve efficiency for our vehicles and help us out here on the ground. And it bursts with the space station on Saturday. and uh, Saturday morning, yes. They'll unload everything into the uh, International Space Station. Um, your thoughts going forward, there is an international docking adapter that's mm-hmm. also going up. Um, it's berthing now with the current docking adapter. Um, it's the same adapter, but now you'll have two places where... Um, uh, the cargo spacecraft can can dock. Well, so this uh, this actually this vehicle goes to the uh, the bottom port, the Nader port of the Harmony node, um, which is a, a it's a berthing mechanism in this case of this vehicle. The docking mechanism that we're the docking adapter that we're bringing up will actually go on the top, mm. um, and matches the one that we have on the forward of the space station that we docked the uh, SpaceX Demo One mission to, and so this will enable us to now have two docked vehicles to the U.S. side of the station at the same time, allowing us to do crew handovers more efficiently and allowing them to talk to each other as they're exchanging things that are going on for one crew that's coming up and the crew that's leaving um, to help really familiarize them with the vehicle and everything that's going on in the current status uh, live face-to-face. And how are you feeling after this launch? Oh, it feels great. It feels really good. Um, This is the 18th one for for SpaceX under the CRS contract. We've got a couple more left with them under CRS-1, and then it's on to our CRS-2 missions. So uh, it's great. uh, We're really happy to get it going and look forward to getting it captured on Saturday morning. Bill Spetch, thank you for joining us. No problem. Appreciate it. That's going to wrap it up for us here at Hangar AE. We'll toss it back to Jen in the studio. Thanks, Daryl. And that's going to wrap up our coverage. For more information, visit nasa.gov slash station or nasa.gov slash SpaceX. I'm Jennifer Wolfinger from everyone here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Thank you for joining us for the successful launch and landing of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. We leave you now with another look at today's launch. Have a great day, everyone. Minus 15 seconds. And the final seconds nine, now. Eight, seven, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. And liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft. On the heels of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11's return from the moon, we send more science and supplies up to the International Space Station. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Looking beautiful so far. 